Mind Your Farm Business on realagriculture.com is brought to you by RBC Royal Bank. Welcome to the Mind Your Farm Business podcast brought to you by RBC Royal Bank. I'm Sean Haney, founder of realagriculture.com and the host of Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio 147 on Sirius XM. You can find more episodes of this podcast by going to mindyourfarmbusiness.com. Many times we talk about the on the ground issues that make a real difference on your farm. But there's also some really big issues that float at 100,000 feet that impact all of us. Issues like access to labor, trade, and technology touch all of us. These are all topics that get thrown around a lot, but they seem so far away from the farm gate on any given day. But their impacts can be felt all the time on the farm. The question is, is this industry and our political leaders doing everything required to allow agriculture to seize the opportunities that we all chat about on real agriculture or around your kitchen table? Today's guest for the Mind Your Farm Business podcast is John Stackhouse. He's a senior VP at RBC Royal Bank. He has written a comprehensive report on how agriculture is intending to launch towards its potential and how it's dealing with some of its restraints. Hey, John, how are you doing today? I'm well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm looking forward to this discussion. You know, agriculture is obviously very, very important to the real agriculture audience, as well as the overall Canadian economy. And recently, you put out this report providing some analysis on what really has to happen if Canada is going to grasp the opportunity of agriculture going forward. And one of the things that you mentioned in the report is about agriculture being a strategic priority. Do, do you feel that agriculture right now is a strategic priority for Canada? When you look at Canada's debates about economic drivers and what we should be investing in or leveraging or taking advantage of to position ourselves in the 21st century, in our view, there's not enough attention on agriculture. Now, we're not the first to point this out. Dominic Barton, in his report for the uh, for the Economic Growth Council, for um, for the Trudeau government, stressed the crying need, but uh, and and opportunity to invest more in agriculture and agriculture for the 21st century. But when we sort of look a- across the country and listen to the discussions about the policies and the priorities. We do have a concern that agriculture is not up there uh, at the top or near the top where it should be. So why is it not? That's you know we've an election campaign. You know the election cycle has started here in Canada, and you know agriculture once again not exactly at the top of the speaking point uh, sheet for really any of the candidates. Why why is it not a priority? Because if if you were to ask you know economists or politicians, people in industry they would all say that agriculture is so critical to the economy, yet it's not its not being that strategic priority. Why is it that way? Yeah, it's a great, uh, it's a great question, Sean. I, I, I think a lot of it is just out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and with that, a lack of familiarity, a lack of proximity for most Canadians to the sector, even though it's very proximate, it's, it's on our tables uh, morning, noon and night, but we don't uh, have the same attachment. You know, when you think of something like the auto sector, which is hugely important, I'm not trying to diminish that, but it's concerning as well as intriguing that the, you know, when, when the auto sector goes through troubles, it gets a lot of political attention. And the same may not be true for, for agriculture. Both are, both are priorities. Um, we calculated in, in, in our study that if we can really enhance what we do in agriculture with the right skills and the right investment in technology. The sector can be bigger than auto and aeronautics put together. I mean, this is a huge, huge economic opportunity for the country. But I think that lack of uh, proximity is is one issue. And then a lack of of an appreciation, and we hope our research helps with this uh, or helps change this, a lack of appreciation of the opportunity. Uh, when we think about how are we going to pay for health care in the 2030s, well, we're going to have to be producing more food and selling that food 
to uh, to the world. When we think about what we're going to trade with Asia in the 2020s and 2030s, yeah, we talk about oil and gas, and those are really important elements of our uh, of our trade strategy. But agriculture is critical to to our trade strategy. Now, you, you do mention you just mentioned trade, and of course, trade is really top of mind for farmers around the world right now. Trade being in agricultural goods being very much used as a chess piece in a lot of the the trade negotiations that are that are currently going on. Canada's Canada's share of agricultural exports globally ha- has been declining. Have we become too reliant on trade or is the issue that we we sort of take agricultural trade for granted and we're not pushing hard enough for it? How do you how does that Yeah, they, I I'd suggest the latter. You know, we need to trade more and we need to be more ambitious with our trading strategy, especially for agriculture products. And we often as a country think about, you know, the tech products that we should be exporting to the world. Fantastic. We should. But there's a lot of value added and a lot of sophistication that goes into the agriculture products that we develop, that we grow, that we produce and then sell to the world. And more focus needs to more focus needs to be on that. We're not naive. Uh, The world of trade has become rougher rougher and tumbler, and that probably ain't going to change anytime soon. But we shouldn't shy away from it. Canadians don't, you know, we don't, we like to think of ourselves as people who go into the corner for the puck in hockey, and we should do the same for for trade. Uh, We think that the demand for food in the 2020s is going to be so significant that kind of mathematics will dictate that the world is going to need more Canadian food. As incomes grow in different parts of the world, the demand for high-quality food, and Canada is one of the few producers and exporters of that, is also going to grow. So history is on our side here, uh, even though you know, we, we, we do have these serious challenges in the immediate term. History is on our side to be a significant, sophisticated food producer for, uh, for the world. We also think there's a really interesting technology opportunity for Canada to invest in things like blockchain, which is going on in, in all sorts of parts of the country. It's really cool to, to, to see this. And I wish more Canadians kind of knew about the tech sophistication in the ag sector. Um, that sort of technology, we think, will help overcome some of the trade um, spat that we get dragged into, which are based often on political and qualitative assessments. Technology is one way of diminishing that that threat. Now, is Canada investing enough in technology in the agricultural space in comparison to some of our biggest competitors like the Black Sea or South America or even the United States? No, no. We think this uh, this is a really interesting challenge and opportunity for the country. There's some terrific work going on and, and, and really valuable investments uh, in pretty much every part of the, co- the country, but it's just not enough and we're not scaling it. If you look at the, the protein uh, industry supercluster in Saskatoon, that's, that's a, a really good advancement. A lot of the work going on in Guelph is uh, terrific. Uh, seafood R&D, or aquaculture R&D that uh, we studied in Halifax is is really impressive but we have to scale this and know that we're up against yeah the u.s which is a a leader in this but israel and china are getting fantastic at this as uh as well and it's not just public sector investment although that's important we've got you know as a report says six of the hundred top ag and food schools in the world are here in canada that's amazing for a country of our size and we have to keep, in our view, investing in R&D through those institutions as well as through private institutions. But we also need to find ways to encourage more commercial R&D to get the private sector, uh, the food producers of the country to be investing more in R&D, developing the IP that will allow them to, to lead the world. Is, is there criticisms of Canada from, from the commercial side, from private industry in terms of their ability to, to justify the investment in technology in, in Canada? Is, there, is, the IRO, is the ROI there, comparatively speaking? That's a great question. And if we're honest with ourselves, we have to accept that our investment 
environment is not as conducive or inviting as it is in a lot of countries that we're competing against, the United States first and foremost. If you're to buy a sophisticated piece of farm machinery or food processing technology, often the tax considerations are more advantageous in the U.S. The availability of capital may be greater, especially venture capital in, uh, in, in, in the U.S. And it's not good enough for us to be kind of neck and neck with the U.S. or matching what they do. Uh, we have to outdo them. Uh, we have to be the place that people are lining up to make their uh, make their investments in. Yeah, you know, we look at our population, uh, you know, with 35, 36 million. Uh, does our population work against us? We're, we're a relatively small country. There, there are cities, or I guess I should say there are states with a lot more people than Canada. D- does that work against us, or is it some sort of an untapped advantage? I, I, you know, I, I guess intellectually we could discuss it as an advantage, but it's it's a real challenge. And in, in fact, there are cities sort of emerging that will be uh, bigger in numbers than the, than us. Uh, so we need to continue to uh, recruit and attract people from around the world uh, for all all parts of the Canadian economy and and all regions of the country. But agriculture, we think, is a really interesting opportunity for Canada to to kind of up our recruitment game to get the best and the brightest in, in all sorts of walks of, uh, of, of life in food and food production, uh, but also to attract and continue to attract food producers who will come with the investment capital to start or expand operations here. We've got the land and the water that every country in the world dreams of uh, and not the people to take advantage of that. So people at 37 million is a challenge and you know given the amount of space we have is actually one that we should be able to take on reasonably well over the next few decades we're going to get right back to my discussion with john stackhouse of rbc royal bank right after a word from the sponsor this episode of the mind your farm business podcast is brought to you by rbc today's producers are thinking hard about where they want to go and what moves to make to get them there A business plan is your roadmap to success. Without one, it's easy to get lost along the way. You can count on the services and expertise RBC offers to help you meet your business goals and chart a course to success. Visit rbc.com slash chart your course to find an agriculture account manager near you. Okay, so let's let's talk about that recruitment. How do we recruit more people into the industry of mm-hmm. agriculture. We know it has fantastic opportunities going forward. There probably are some stigmas that still hold us back from a recruitment standpoint, but how do we, how do we change this narrative? It, it, changing the narrative is, I mean, it sounds simple, um, and to some people it may even come across as frivolous, but it's really important. And, and one of our recommendations was for whoever forms the next government in Ottawa to bring industry and provinces together and like, let's figure out a way to, 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 to develop a new narrative around Canadian agriculture. We're great as a country. Uh, we're great as storytellers. Let's you know, bring our great Canadian storytelling to the ag story of the 2020s. We need to do that globally and nationally. Globally, there, there's millions of people engaged in sophisticated agriculture around the world who may see Canada as an opportunity and they may want to come from the U.S. They may come from Israel or Russia or Australia or dozens of other countries. We need to get that narrative to them so that Canada is at the top of their list of places they would consider moving and starting new businesses or joining successful farm operations and food production operations here. Nationally, it's a really interesting challenge to try to convince younger Canadians of the enormous opportunities, economic, but also lifestyle, uh, in pursuing a farm or food-related career. Uh, you're, you're well familiar with the numbers, but it's, it's pretty sobering when we look at the number of farmers due to retire over the next five years. That's a crisis. And then lay that up against the fact that fewer 20-somethings than ever this year are going into farming and the number will be fewer next year. It, that, that's a real, real challenge. So how do we convince 
18 year olds, although some say you got to start younger <laughs> with the eight year olds of the country, uh, whatever the age that we're targeting, how do we convince them that you can pursue the most digital, dig, you can pursue the most digitally sophisticated career in the world through farming. You can be relevant to the future of the planet through farming. This is what so many young people want today. You don't need to go work for Amazon to uh, be at the cutting edge of technology. You can do that working on a farm or living in any number of communities. You don't have to be a, a, a food pr producer. You can work with food producers uh, and apply your digital skills in all sorts of uh, all sorts of new ways. And we think this narrative also needs to excite the country about the about the imperative. We, it, it's a moral imperative to help feed the world. There's going to be a billion more people on the planet pretty soon, and we're going to have to. I think the number is produce as much food in the next 40 years as has been, pr been produced in the history of this planet. Uh, we can't do that just by doing more of the same. So how do we get the great innovators, the creative entrepreneurial minds of the country to say, you know, this can be our moonshot. Let's, uh, you know, let's join the, 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 the moonshot that Canada wants to la launch for, for agriculture to help feed the world in the 2020s and 2030s. Do you think, you know, so far we've talked about technology and attracting people to, to work in agriculture. Do you think one of the stigmas here is, is that, you know, we're, we're asking for two things that conflict with each other in the sense we're saying, you know, we need more technology, we need more implementation of technology on the farm. Uh, some people jump to like autonomous tractors. And of course we already have things like robotic milkers. So why would I become a, a, a worker in primary agriculture if I'm due to be possibly replaced by robotics in the next coming decade? Do, do you think that hurts at all? It, it's a fair question. We've done a, a, a very broad research report called Humans Wanted, which we published uh, last year. And our agriculture report, Farmers 4.0, was a direct follow on to that because we wanted to start to look at specific sectors, starting with agriculture, because it's so important to the country. But in Humans Wanted, you know, we, we amassed a database of 2 million jobs uh, in the country and developed our own algorithms to, to understand the skills that were in demand and discovered that what we've seen over 300 years of tech revolutions is happening again, that technology always leads to more jobs, not less. It just leads to different jobs. And we're seeing this play out in, in curious ways in the agriculture sector. So you mentioned robotic milkers. Uh, clearly, that's going to displace the old-fashioned milker. Not many of those around anymore. But it's creating new demand for data analysts uh, on the farm. And sometimes there are data analysts who will work with a series of farmers as a consultant. You're not going to be a direct uh, live-on-the-farm farmhand. Uh, so I, I cite that as, as an example of the new sorts of jobs that are emerging and could attract people who maybe don't want to literally get their hands dirty uh, or don't want to work directly on a farm but would be interested in applying their tech savviness to, uh, to, uh, to agriculture. In your opinion, does the Canadian immigration policies that we currently have, do they align with the needs of agriculture to recruit some people to be working on the farm? They align with the pressure point of today. One of our concerns is that we're not thinking enough about what the pressure points will be a decade from now. So right now, our immigration approach to agriculture is largely seasonal workers. That's critical. And we have a reasonably successful program. Uh, in fact, it's very successful in a number of, sec of sectors and regions. And that will continue for a number of years, but it may not continue forever because of the automation that we're seeing in different sectors or subsectors of agriculture. Take greenhouses, for instance. Greenhouses are an area that are ripe, pardon the expression, but ripe for automation. And we're seeing that all over the world. The Netherlands is leading in this. The United States is moving fairly quickly. We rely on a lot of seasonal workers in, uh, in our greenhouses. And there's a risk that over the longer term, let's say over the decade, if we continue to rely on that 
that uh, re- rely on labor more than capital uh, and rely on seasonal seasonal labor, which tends to be lower skilled, lower uh, lower paid, we'll be at a competitive dis- disadvantage a decade or two out as our competitors invest in these new technologies. Reminds me a bit of what happened in the auto sector in the 1970s. And we've got to be careful that we don't fall into the same trap where we we uh, focus on labor and not enough on capital, and particularly in agriculture, that we focus on seasonal labor and don't think about the enhanced skills that those seasonal workers may need to develop over time to work with these new technologies. Okay, so whether we're talking about somebody that is a, you know, we call labor on the farm in primary agriculture, or we're talking about the next plant breeder, or maybe the next uh, corporate CEO in agriculture, we've got to recruit these people into the industry. Uh, some of them are going to come from outside of Canada, and some of them are great candidates uh, domestically. What about the education system? You, you mentioned Canadian universities previously, but let's even take it to high schools and elementary schools in Canada. Are we talking enough about the industry to students uh, from all backgrounds? No, not anywhere close to enough. Uh, and it's a great opportunity if we can double down or, or create a new narrative and, and invest in it. Uh, we were impressed with some insights from Australia where they t- teach agriculture or use agriculture to help teach kindergarten students and stick with it through high school. And you're not teaching you know, kindergarten kids or primary school kids how to farm, although maybe you do teach them how to grow things. But you use agriculture as a way of, of teaching all sorts of things, including digital skills, uh, including software skills. And as we're teaching kids, let's say, to code, um, let's ensure that we are using enough case studies and illustrations and narratives to say, you know, if you're learning a code, it's not just so that you can go develop software for you know, one of the global giants, that may be a good career for you, but you may develop software to create the farm of the future that's going to help feed the planet. And, you know, if that's how we're teaching 12 year olds, we think that's inspiring and engaging and would be smart for, uh, for Canada strategically. So my assumption would be that in the U S they're having the same discussion in the Australia, they're having the same discussion in the UK. They're having the same discussion is, is the, really the question though, which one of those countries and in other ones that are in the same in the same boat, which one of the countries or a group of countries actually does something about it? Yeah, I, I wouldn't assume that all the countries you mentioned are having this discussion. We, we also have to be mindful that many of our uh, kind of peer countries, I'm thinking of the Netherlands or Israel, are small enough to move very quickly. And when they innovate, they often do so very quickly because of their small population size uh, relative to the superpowers, but also their small geography. We have a relatively small population and need to use that to our advantage. We're small enough to get things done. Yes, we're big geographically, but that's also an advantage. So how do we work together as kind of a tight-knit community of 38 million people uh, with a massive expanse of land and water. Uh, those are twin twin advantages. Um, but we also have to be mindful and remind ourselves that a lot of other countries are moving very quickly, moving aggressively. Uh, it's really impressive to see what's going on in the U.S. Uh, across the farm belt, but also in states like California. Uh, it's impressive to see what Australia is, uh, is doing. And we're really good at agriculture. Like, you know, top tier in the world, absolutely. But we could easily slide. Uh, so we need to remind ourselves that others are uh, are moving quickly. We need to learn from them, study from them, and, you know, if needed, bring those ideas here, but also make sure we're, we're uh, out there competing with them for every market that we can. Yeah. Hey, John, this has been a fantastic conversation. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here on the Mind Your Farm Business Podcast. Sean, I really appreciate your interest. Thanks, uh, thanks for having us. Some great comments from John Stackhouse today. I found it very interesting to hear and talk about our need to diversify trade flows, invest in technology, while needing to recruit the brightest and smartest people into the industry at all levels. No small challenges at all. But I know one thing, 
Agriculture is resilient, it has big goals, and it can meet the challenges that are laid in its path. I hope that you enjoyed today's discussion. If you have any feedback, please email me at shaney at realagriculture.com or call the Real Ag Listener line at 855-776-6147. I would love to hear what you thought about today's discussion. Did we miss anything? Do you have some thoughts? Love to hear your opinion on this or any topic discussed on the Mind Your Farm Business podcast. You can find more episodes of Mind Your Farm Business by going to mindyourfarmbusiness.com. Thanks to RBC Royal Bank. And until next time, keep on minding your farm business.